The tunnels of Moose Jaw, located in Saskatchewan, Canada, invite visitors to head beneath the streets of downtown Moose Jaw to experience firsthand the hardships of early Chinese immigrants in the Passage to Fortune tour and relive Al Capone's bootlegging days in the Chicago Connection tour. As explained by Kelly Cardi, the tunnel's cast director, in an interview she did in 2014. It's a historical reenactment. We have two separate tours. We have the Chicago Connection, but that's about gangsters, bootlegging, Al Capone's connections to Moose Jaw. And then we have the Passage to Fortune. Now that's the story of the early Chinese immigrants in Canada and their struggles to help build the country. The tunnels, which opened on June 15, 2000, have inspired a book series by Mary Harlequin Bishop and are a popular attraction for students and tourists alike. I went down to the University of Saskatchewan to talk to an expert in prairie history about the fake history presented in the Passage to Fortune tour. I'll let her introduce herself. I'm Dr. Ashley Androsov, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Saskatchewan in the Department of History. Today on Historia Nostra, we're asking, how do visitors to the tunnels of Moose Jaw experience Chinese migration to southern Saskatchewan? So, Dr. Andrasa, um, walking through the tunnels, what would a visitor expect to see? Well, first, you, you enter the exhibit really through the ticket office, and then you're gathered together as a group in the ticket office, and you walk down the street to what is presented as the entrance to Mr. Burroughs' laundry circa 1907. So you go down a set of stairs, and you're, you're going into what would be the storefront of the laundry. Um, there's a bit of a chat there, and then you're taken into the back end of the laundry where um, uh, packaged wash clothes ostensibly are prepared for return to the customer. And then you're taken into further back end space, uh, which is presented as um, <clears throat> potentially um, a, a nicer accommodation for a Chinese immigrant. And then you're taken into a theater space and you're shown a brief a uh, film that is presented as sort of a documentary, but it's actually a fictionalized account. Mm. And then you're taken into a boiler room. Past the boiler room, you're taken into um, a space which is um, another accommodation space. And that's uh, with the pretext that the tourists are Chinese laundry workers. You're informed that that's not your space. You're taken into a further backroom space, which uh, does lay out the accommodations, supposedly, for the Chinese laundry worker underground. And it's sort of a triple bunk system, a very primitive kind of accommodation. Mm -hmm. And then you're taken behind that into a space that's supposedly the laundry, um, where there's there's washing implements and things like that. There's an animatron animatronic version of... Mr. Burroughs, who then gives a speech to the Chinese workers. You're taken through a tunnel uh, space underground to uh, retrieve, somebody sent to retrieve a, a lamp and bring it back to the crowd. And then you walk through that tunnel space. In, in the further back end, you're shown uh, a burlap sack factory space, and then um, an opium den space, and then what is supposed to be the basement of a Chinese restaurant. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you're taken into what's presented as an immigration hall processing space. And following that, you are taken into a hallway that's lined with historic photographs. And then your tour is finished. So are guests uh, involved in the narrative at all? Or are they just kind of observers of what's going on as they walk through the space? When the tourists enter into the storefront of the laundry, the, the tour guide will explain that um, you're kind of cast as Chinese workers being onboarded into this uh, employment. And the tour guide makes it clear that they're going to use repeatedly the term coolie, which is a, a racist epithet that refers to a, a Chinese worker, but also implies negative things about social class and, and racialization. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the tourist is uh, supposed to be 
playing the part of a Chinese worker being acclimatized to this new environment. And at certain points in the tour, uh, at one point in particular, one of the tourists is asked to play a very specific role in retrieving the lamp and bringing it back to the uh, other tourists. Uh, and is the guide in costume when they're guiding you through this? The guide is in costume. I've, I've taken the tour three times now. Twice it was led by a male tour guide and once by a female tour guide. In the event that it's a male tour guide, the, uh, the tour guide plays the role of a steam engineer. Mm -hmm. And in the event that it's a female tour guide, she plays the role of, of his wife. In, in both cases, they're dressed in sort of simple working class kind of clothing. And they, um, in all cases, play a character who is quite abrasive. Um, and what is the historical basis of the tour, if there is any? Um, there are some aspects of the narrative that is presented in the tour that are uh, factually and historically true. So, for example, it, it is uh, historically true that Chinese people were often involved in running laundries, particularly in a town like Moose Jaw. Um, so association of uh, Chinese ethnicity, uh, Chinese immigrants coming to Canada in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s were involved in the laundry business, were also involved often in the restaurant business. So relating those kinds of employment to Chinese ethnicity is historically accurate. Um, beyond that, the majority of the information provided in the tour uh, is not grounded in historical evidence. So what are some of the things that you would consider more problematic about the narrative that they're telling? The, the, the most uh, glaring problem with the presentation at the tour is um, the way that it sets a white proprietor, Mr. Burroughs, up as the abusive employer of essentially what are indentured Chinese servant workers uh, forced to live and work underground. The tour script makes it very clear that um, these Chinese workers would have been forced to work underground because um, either they had not been properly processed through immigration, had not paid their head tax, um, or, and they really emphasize this point, if they went above ground in Moose Jaw, they would be exposed to such egregious racism that it would be Im impossible for them to survive. It would be, um, they would be risking their, their, their physical safety, not to, not to mention their psychological safety. Um, and so the, the tour explains that it's actually, you know, in some ways safer for them to be ensconced underground. Nothing could be further than the truth. Um, the, the, the story of Chinese immigration to Western Canada in general suggests very different trends, and that's particularly the case in a place like Moose Jaw. Moose Jaw historically actually had um, uh, one of the highest concentrations of Chinese immigrant populations in Saskatchewan. That was still a very small minority population, um, but Moose Jaw was actually considered to be a relatively, um, like, like a, a pref preferable place for Chinese immigrants in Saskatchewan to be living because the environment was more hospitable than perhaps other places. Um, <clears throat> we have evidence, for example, in 1908 that there were nine laundries being run in Moose Jaw at that time. So one year after the, the laundry is supposedly established in the tunnels of Moose Jaw in 1907. So in 1908, we have evidence that there were nine laundries running in Moose Jaw eight of which were clearly run by Chinese proprietors. Mm -hmm. The ninth was not. It was run by a white proprietor, but the white proprietor used uh, labor-saving machines, according to their advertising. So, um, as far as we know, did not employ Chinese labor, but rather uh, took a mechanized approach. So there would be no need for a Chinese immigrant who is interested in the laundry business to work for a white proprietor when the majority of laundries running in Moose Jaw were owned by Chinese business people and uh, Chinese workers would have had the opportunity to work for uh, neighbors, friends, relatives, uh, what have you. So um, 
We also have evidence from fire insurance maps from 1914 that clearly show that Chinese businesses were running above ground, including laundries, including a laundry that was running directly across the street from the entry to the tunnels of Moose Jaw. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about the tunnel being promoted as an educational opportunity. Uh, is there any opportunity for guests to interact with the guides and ask questions? That <clears throat> That is one of the issues with the presentation of the tour. So um, a, a tourist who isn't familiar with the history and wasn't approaching the presentation with a critical lens could, could easily be convinced by the presentation that what they were seeing was absolutely historically correct. Because one gets the sense it's one gets the sense that one is at, um, say, a historic site run by the government of Canada, Parks Canada. At, um, it, at certain museums, the tour guides appear in costume, they have you play a role. I'm thinking particularly of the time that I went to the Georges George Etienne Cartier Museum in, in Ottawa. Right, You come in, the, the tourists are playing the part of servants being onboarded into the house, and there's uh, a a person in costume that's explaining some of the implements of the house and so on. Like, so, so this would look a lot like that, like a historically grounded presentation. Um, the artifacts that are in the space are not original to the space. There's no explanation of the artifacts, what they are, why they're there. There's no placards. There's nothing um, that would identify them as being, you know, a, a typical hygiene kit of a Chinese worker circa 1900 or whatever. You just, these things are just strewn about. Um, the only interpretation opportunity that you have is through the script that the tour guide is narrating to you. And that script is very fixed. It's very consistent across the three tours that I took. It was very consistent and also very clear that the tour guide um, really felt uh, the time pressure of sticking to the script. They tell you from the beginning of the tour that questions are only acceptable at the end. You're not really supposed to interrupt the tour script to say, did this really happen? Um, why are there three beds here? What are we doing in an opium den? Like there's, there's no opportunity to ask those questions. At the conclusion of the tour, you can ask questions. Unfortunately, the tour guides um, training does not allow them to answer the questions in a historically accurate way. So for example, I asked the question, were there any laundries in Moose Jaw run by Chinese business owners? And the answer I was given was no, it would have been impossible. But I know for a fact um, that there were. And the evidence for that is found just a few blocks from the tunnels of Moose Jaw in the uh, archives at the public library of Moose Jaw. Talked a little bit about uh, interpretation opportunities being one way that yeah. the tunnels could improve themselves. Are there any others that you can think of? It would be challenging for the tunnels of Moose Jaw to revise the tour in a way that was historically accurate and also made it logical to host the tour in the tunnels. So historically speaking, there were underground spaces in Moose Jaw, that's not in dispute. The idea that there were tunnels um, that were connected and used for nefarious purposes, that they were constructed by Chinese workers who were forced to hide underground, which is something the tour presents. Um, there's no historical evidence to demonstrate that. There's no um, sort of uh, built evidence that these tunnels existed as a, as a intentional network for the transportation of people or goods. So the very premise of the tunnels being there, um, th there's, there's no way to remedy the historical accuracy of that because uh, um, according to Moose Jaw's own research, that wasn't the case. All right, thank you, Dr. Anjosa, for sharing your uh, research on the tunnels with us. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we let you go? <laughs> um, just that I'm, I'm a big fan of public history and presenting history in formats that are accessible to the public, even enjoyable to, to the public. And I really celebrate the Tunnels of Moose Jaw for making a presentation that does just that. And I celebrate the Tunnels of Moose Jaw for um, 
for providing something that is so economically rich for the town. Those are things that the tunnels of Lusja does really well. I wish that what they presented in the tunnels was historically accurate and presented in an ethical way. And that's where I take issue with their presentation. Okay. The passage to fortune tour at the tunnels of Moose Jaw, while being well intended in its inclusion as part of the tunnels experience, does not accurately tell the history of Chinese migration to the prairies. The tour perpetuates certain stereotypes about Chinese migrants including that opium was a significant problem among early Chinese Canadians. Visitors, therefore, do not experience a good history of Chinese migration to Saskatchewan, contrary to what the tunnels claim to offer. If you'd like to learn more about the history of Chinese migration to the prairies or the tunnels of Moose Jaw, check out the links in the description. Special thanks to Dr. Ashley Androsov for speaking with us. Our theme music is by Broke for Free. Learn more at brokeforfree.bandcamp.com.